It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single book in possession of a good story must be in want of a cookbook. Jane Austen, probably. Hello, and welcome back to the channel. It's Lit Life with Mandy Reads, and today I'm going to be sharing one of my life's passions. To own as many literary cookbooks as my bookshelves can physically handle. Over the past decade, I have collected nearly four dozen literary cookbooks. And let me tell you, not all cookbooks are created equal. There are some stunning works of literature, and there are some that are probably better used as recycling. But how can you tell that without buying it yourself? I'm glad you asked and I'm here to answer. This video is the definitive guide to literary cookbooks. Let's get started. I've divided my books into five categories. There's the bare minimums, the hardly theirs, the kind of presents, the runner ups, and the top tiers. The first category is our one star reads, AKA our barely theirs. We have fairy tale baking, the Wind in the Willows cookbook, and the Nancy Drew cookbook. All of these books qualify as bare minimums because they feel so low effort when it comes to the literary cookbook. Honestly, other than the title and a handful of tangentially related recipes, they are indistinguishable from a regular cookbook. Now, Fairy Tale Baking was a literary cookbook that I have been waiting ages to buy. And imagine my shock and utter disappointment that the book that has, mind you, the tagline of delicious treats inspired by Snow White, Hansel and Gretel, and other classic stories, that tagline of that book manages to not have a single connection between any of the treats and the stories. Literally, the lowest possible hanging fruit would be to include a gingerbread recipe under the Hansel and Gretel section, and this book doesn't even manage that. The recipes, I will say they are valid, but they aren't organized alphabetically by type or even contain the slightest hint as to why they were chosen in relation to the main stories. The Wind in the Willows cookbook is an old timey good for the soul country cookbook. And the recipes are good, but the only connection between these recipes and the original source material is a smattering of illustrations that contain some of the more famous characters. And finally, we have the Nancy Drew ones. And we have a similar issue. The recipes don't seem to relate overtly to the stories. The titles sometimes hint at major characters or plot points, but unless you are incredibly well versed in the series, I feel like this book is gonna be like any other random cookbook out there. Moving up a notch are my two star reads, AKA my hardly theirs. To qualify as a hardly there literary cookbook, it has to be more firmly centered around a bookish theme than the one stars. But even then, as a two-star, they don't always cite their sources or provide context for why these recipes are chosen. There's the Harry Potter College Cookbook, The Magical Kitchen, Laura Ingalls Wilder Country Cookbook, a couple of Peter Rabbit cookbooks, the Winnie the Pooh Cookbook, and its various mini Winnies. Starting off with the Harry Potter College Cookbook, I do want to say this is a roller coaster for me. I like the concept of creating a simple and effective cookbook based off of the Harry Potter series, However, when you delve into these recipes, you realize that the only real relation they have to the source material is their names. AKA, the recipes have names related to places, people, and concepts from Harry Potter, but the recipes themselves don't make sense within the context of the stories. For example, there's the Gryffindor sandwich, which is essentially, get this, mustard, tomatoes, barbecue sauce, and cheddar cheese which makes absolutely no sense given the era and the setting of the book. At most, I think it might be included because of the colors, red and yellow. Now there are several other recipes in this book that are of a similar fashion. Like there's a sandwich type for each of the Weasleys, but I don't recall other than Ron, anyone actually having a particular sandwich to call their own in the series, which makes me think that this author just wanted to make a Harry Potter cookbook and didn't actually care too much about making it accurate or palatable. Now the Magical Kitchen manages to take all the things I didn't like from the Harry Potter College cookbook and double down on them. While this one does contain somewhat accurate recipes to the book, AKA Butterbeer, 
It often twists the recipes in ways that don't make sense given the source material, aka a butterbeer frappe. In addition, this cookbook also manages to take well-known recipes and butcher them, like acid pops, where according to this book, you are supposed to dip a sucker in honey and cover it in pop rocks. The photograph showcasing this recipe has sprinkles attached to the sucker. Then we have the Laura Ingalls Wilder Country Cookbook, and this was created by a historical society centered around her life and preserving her legacy. Now, I do adore how this one covers the late author's life and provides several interesting snippets. Um, unfortunately, the recipes included often seem like random foods that she may have enjoyed, rather than ones directly related to her life and literature. Laura Ingalls Wilder writes about food so frequently in her books that I'm kind of shocked that the recipes included in this cookbook aren't more researched. If the authors had gone through her book series or provided context to the recipes included, my rating for this one would be very, very different. Next up, we have a couple of Peter Rabbit cookbooks. For both of these, they have recipes named after specific characters from the original series, but again, no justification for why they were chosen or why they were named after specific characters. There aren't any citations to tell you where they come from in this series. And while I do love the illustrations, and the recipes do appear to be delicious, the lack of connection is really a sticking point for me. And finally, we have my Winnie the Pooh section. Now the two larger ones are actually different editions of the same recipe book. The only major difference are the illustrations and the layouts. Now for these books, they do have a lot of random honey recipes, which aligns with the Pooh themed, but not many of these recipes appear in the original story. It kind of feels like the author just tried to stuff as many honey-related things as they possibly could into one book because, well, you know, like poo and honey. It also has lamb patties with mint sauce and jelly omelets, which completely baffle me as to their connection to poo, rabbit, tigger, and friends. Meat recipes included in here also confuse me because poo was friends with Piglet and Tigger had this whole backstory about why he doesn't eat meat. So why would there be a lamb recipe in this themed cookbook? Each of the mini winnies are centered along a theme. There's cookies, picnics, and tea time, which are events and meals that do happen in the Winnie the Pooh universe. So, however, similar to other books that are in this category, the recipes chosen for these cookbooks seem to have little to no connection to the story's text. They are more like recipes that you could make if you were doing the same events as Pooh rather than recipes that Pooh has made. And that is a really important distinction for a literary cookbook. And there's more meat recipes, and it just feels a bit weird. There are recipes about ham, and one of the characters is Piglet. I don't know, is it just me? It can't just be me, right? Then we have the three-star category, AKA the kind of presence. For the kind of present category, we are getting a little bit more nuance, leaning more into personal preference when it comes to books in this category. But again, what we're looking for is a strong literary connection, solid recipes, and the book has to be well made. In this one, we have the Wizard's Cookbook, the Wizard's Dessert Cookbook, a Christmas Carol Cookbook, Fanny Flagg's Original Whistle Stop Cafe Cookbook, the Original Secret Garden Cookbook, the Boxcar Children's Cookbook, and the Jane Austen Cookbook and the Book Lover's Cookbook. First up is the Duology of Wizards Cookbooks. Now this is by the same author as the Harry Potter College Cookbook, but I will say that these ones are marginally better. The recipes are based off of wizards and magical beings from books, movies, television, legends, and music videos, so it's a little bit more loosey-goosey in terms of the interpretation of a literary cookbook. And the recipes do seem a bit more connected to the source material than the Harry Potter College cookbook, but not enough to bump it to anything higher than three stars. The recipes seem to be chosen based off of a theme rather than things that are actually appearing in the story. Like there's an ogre avocado milkshake for Shrek or a garlic tart for Dungeons and Dragons. So again, it feels like the author is just picking things to fit a surface level theme in addition, some of the recipes included are extremely questionable, like this one based off of the Smurfs. It has chicken and blue candy spaghetti. Yay. From there, we have the Christmas Carol Cookbook. And I want to say right off the bat, I adore this one. 
I love it wholeheartedly, and I would recommend it to anyone who loves this story. I do have to remain objective and keep this one at three stars. Because while it does contain the entirety of the Christmas Carol story, it only actually has 12 recipes chosen to exemplify the story and culminate in a gorgeous holiday meal. So the ratio of story to recipes is just too far off for this one to be considered anything higher. Then we have Fanny Flagg's original Whistle Stop Cafe Cookbook. The author made this cookbook based off of the real life inspiration for the Whistle Stop Cafe and it contains some of the recipes that made it into the story, aka fried green tomatoes. But it also contains a lot of other more random recipes that belong to the original cafe. So it is a fabulous cookbook in general and provides a wonderful peek into the olden diner days. I just don't feel like there's enough of an overlap between the original story to warrant it any higher on this list. Then we have the Boxcar Children's Cookbook. And honestly, this one straddles the edge between this level and the one below. Because while the recipes are firmly grounded in the series, thanks to a plethora of quotes, I feel like I would have to reread the entire series to understand the context of these quotes. And the recipes included don't have much of a razzle-dazzle. They feel a bit vague and plain. I think a tried and true fan might enjoy this one more than me, though. The Jane Austen Cookbook starts off with about 40 pages of historical context and background regarding what food was like during Jane Austen's era. From there, it has a hodgepodge of very loosely organized recipes that would make using this cookbook regularly somewhat of a nightmare. I do like how the recipes are often cited, but it doesn't feel like it's enough. I feel like we need more context for why each of these recipes were included and their specific connection to Austen. And finally, in this category, we have the Book Lover's Cookbook. I'm keeping this one at three stars for a couple of reasons. Namely, the recipes are grouped according to time of day, which isn't so bad, but the actual order of the recipes within each category is a complete mess. The layout is just one recipe after another very small print, light blue for some reason, which makes ease of use and readability at a near zero for me. And while each recipe is accompanied by a quote, Again, we're missing the context behind these quotes, and given the sheer volume of books included, that context feels essential. Now we're transitioning into my four star reads, aka my runner ups. Now keep in mind, I'm getting really picky here because there's a fine line between four and five star literary cookbooks. I would say that these ones in general are amazing, but there's just like one or two little things that hold them back from being perfect. And this is also where we get into a few book scandals, so stay tuned. We have the unofficial Hogwarts for the Holiday Cookbook, Roland Dahl's Revolting Recipes, The Old Farmer's Almanac, The Everyday in Garden Fresh, Recipes from the World of Tolkien, Dinner with Darcy and its companion novel, Tea with Jane Austen, The Little Woman Cookbook, A Literary Holiday Cookbook, and A Literary Tea Party. Also, just as a quick note, if these sound good to you, then I recommend purchasing them. So the first one we have is the unofficial Hogwarts Holiday Cookbook. This cookbook is organized according to holidays from the Harry Potter series. So there's recipes that represent the start of term feast, Halloween, death day parties, winter recipes from the Yule Ball, and so on. I love this thematic approach. And while we're given justification for the recipes, I would say it does sometimes feel a bit loose. I feel like adding quotes to explain where the recipes came from would be much appreciated. In addition, the further out we go into the holidays, the less recipes that are provided per category. So we go from having 10 items for the snacks for a train section to just one for a July 31st birthday. The lack of balance is really what kind of keeps it at four stars for me. Then we have Roland Dahl's Revolting Recipes, and this one is really well organized. The recipes are thoughtfully chosen, and even though they don't have a blurb or a quote, you can always tell instantly what story they're from, and they also make a lot of sense given the stories they're based on. The recipes are sometimes questionable, like the snozcumbers or the wormy spaghetti, but other than that, this book is a fine representation of Dahl's work. And then we have the Old Farmer's Almanac. Now this is based off of the Old Farmer's Almanac, which is a yearly reference serial that has been in continuous publication since 1792. It contains information about weather predictions, astronomy, gardening, social commentary, and cooking. 
and the Old Farmer's Almanac cookbooks contain some of the best recipes that were featured in earlier editions of these periodicals. Of the two, the Garden Cookbook contains a more modern, updated look, and I really enjoy the gardening tidbits in between the pages. Pages? Recipes. <laughs> from there, we have Recipes from the World of Token, which is a Hobbit and Lord of the Rings themed cookbook. This one has gorgeous paintings and illustrations of the recipes throughout. Each of these recipes has a blurb and some have paragraphs or quotes, but not all of them. I do think that it needs to be a little bit firmer on the grounding context between the recipes and the source material. Because some of these recipes are easy to place, but other ones baffle me for why they are included. Moving on, we have our first scandal, Dinner with Darcy and its companion novel, Tea with Jane Austen. Both of these books are written by the same author. Dinner with Darcy contains recipes from various Jane Austen books, along with meals mentioned in various letters. And I do feel like these recipes are missing, I would say probably quotes and page numbers. It feels like it lacks organization overall. And the recipes are grouped according to source content, so letters and novels, which definitely scrambles the actual recipes around in the book because of that. It feels like the only functional way to use this one is to constantly flip to the index and look up the recipes individually. Now, shortly after purchasing Dinner with Darcy, I obtained Tea with Jane Austen. Imagine my surprise when I'm reading Tea with Jane Austen and realize that it overlaps a lot with Dinner with Darcy. And when I looked into it more, literally every single one of the 21 recipes are copied over from Dinner with Darcy, word from word, picture from picture. I feel like there is a basic assumption that if you buy the second book by an author, that you aren't just buying book two because you want the same exact recipes from book one. The author never mentions this in the introductions, and it leads me to believe that she was just hoping we wouldn't notice. Anyway, because of the sheer level of overlap, I do feel like these books don't truly deserve a rating, but if I remain objective, I would say that they are four star books. I would recommend just buying one of them though. Then there's the Little Woman Cookbook, and this is a really lovely literary cookbook. Most of the recipes are accompanied by a quote and a blurb, though some of the quotes appear at the beginning of each section, so require a little bit of flipping back and forth to understand their inclusion. I feel like the recipes are a little bit more niche and they are organized according to character in the book, which makes it a little bit difficult to use function-wise. However, for the most part, I think this is a lovely, lovely cookbook. Next up is the Secret Garden Cookbook. Now this is the original edition and it's between three and four stars, which is why you saw it pop up on screen earlier. I do love the fresh farm to table aspect of this book, but the layout and the way the recipes are presented makes it feel a little bit dated. Stay tuned for a look at the newest edition though. And finally, there's the Literary Tea Party and a Literary Holiday Cookbook. The Tea Party book emphasizes snacks enjoyed by literary characters, while the Holiday Cookbook creates meal plans based off of beloved series and various holidays. Now these are two of my favorite cookbooks with a slight lean towards the Holiday Cookbook. They both have great context, amazing recipes. The only problem is that the author copy-pasted word for word, picture from picture. We have a 10% overlap between the two books. And this was just such an incredibly disappointing moment for me because these books are so flippin' gorgeous. But the self-plagiarism is just so frustrating and annoying. When I buy a second book from an author, it's because I love the author and want to support them in the creation of new content, not because I want to buy copies of book one's content. Um, one more thing, if you had to choose one, I would say go with the holiday cookbook. I think the layout works a lot better and the recipes, I just, they have a little extra razzle dazzle. And finally, we have the cream of the crap, the five star reads. These are the top tiers. To be in a top tier category, the recipes have to be thematically appropriate, true to the setting of the story, to be cited, context given. They don't have to have photographs, but if they do, they need to be stunning. What I'm saying is the qualifications for this category are numerous and the cutoffs are steep. 
We have Outlander Kitchen, To the New World and Back Again, The Little Library Year, Dinner with Dickens, The Little House Cookbook, The Secret Garden Updated, The Anne of Green Gables, and The Little Woman Cookbook. First up, we have the Outlander Kitchen, To the New World and Back Again. This is based off of the Outlander series, and it's the second of two Outlander cookbooks. It contains more recipes from later in the series. They are wonderfully chosen, photographed, and cited. Not a single overlap between this cookbook and the other one of the same series. I love the sheer attention to detail in this one. The Little Library Year is a gorgeous take on a literary cookbook. The book is split up according to season, from long winter nights to the height of summer, and back again to days growing short. The author selects books that are the epitome of that season and recipes based off of seasonal ingredients. This is an atypical literary cookbook and I love it. Then there's Dinner with Dickens, which is by the same author as Dinner with Darcy and its mini-me, P with Jane Austen. Thankfully, none of the recipes are copied word from word. There's a slight overlap when it comes to the baked sole and the mince pies, but the author does switch up the proportions of the recipes enough that I'll let it slide. Similar to Dinner with Darcy, the organization is a bit loosey-goosey, but the recipes chosen and the context provided more than makes up for it. Then there's The Little House on the Prairie Cookbook. This is one of the earlier editions of the book, and while it is wonderfully written, it is missing that little extra bit of pizzazz which the most current edition has. More on that later. From there we have the updated Secret Garden Cookbook. Now this is a newer edition and the two of them are pretty similar, but this new one has photographs, an updated layout, and updated text. And I feel like the new edition is just so much more aesthetically pleasing and it really draws in the audience because of that. In short, it is gorgeous. It keeps true to the source material and the era the recipes are really appealing and they provide a lovely way to experience the secret garden. Anne of Green Gables cookbook and this is one of my coolest ones because the author actually has a degree in food and nutrition and the author of this cookbook is the real life granddaughter of Ella M. Montgomery who is the author of the Anne of Green Gables series. The recipes chosen are quintessential to the Anne series and it also contains recipes from L. L. Montgomery's own kitchen, which makes this book amazing to me. Then we have my second Little Woman cookbook, and this one's a bit shorter than a typical cookbook, but I adore the way the author put it together. The design is lovely, the photographs are appealing, the historical and literary context given to each recipe makes it a really fun and informative read. And last but not least, we have the absolute tippy top literary cookbooks. These are five plus stars. They are absolutely incredible and truly belong on the shelves of any literary fan. We have A Feast of Ice and Fire, An Unexpected Cookbook, Outlander Kitchen, The Unofficial Harry Potter Cookbook, The Unofficial Hunger Games Cookbook, The Unofficial Chronicles of Narnia Cookbook, and The Little Library Cookbook. Now, The Little Library Cookbook is written by the same author as A Little Library Year. However, this one contains 100 recipes inspired by literary characters and their books. The recipes are grouped according to time eaten from early morning to midnight feasts and a special collection for parties, celebrations, Christmas recipes, etc. I like that the author provides quotes and then also short stories from her own life about how these recipes and books influenced her. Then there's the Feast of Ice and Fire. This is a wonderful way to experience the Feast of Fancy from the Game of Thrones series. The recipes are grouped more so according to location slash setting than they are to time of day, but the recipes in general are really well done. They look delicious and they are completely on point with the theme. From there we have the Hobbit and Unexpected Cookbook. It feels like an absolute must for any true Lord of the Rings fan. The author has just put in so much work into this book, and I am always and continuously amazed by it. They took Middle Ages recipes and techniques and updated them to a modern era, in addition to limiting the recipe book to the cuisine that would be available according to J.R.R. Tolkien's world. So much detail, so much magic. And then we have the unofficial Hunger Games cookbook 
and it is unique. This is probably like the, the greatest variety I've ever seen in a cookbook. We have meals from Katniss's worst days where she had to hunt small game and try and find a way to make it palatable. And we also have recipes from the most opulent of foods in the capital. The sheer variety is what really appeals to me and the connections the author makes to the text cinches it. From there we have the Outlander Kitchen, which is the first of the Outlander cookbooks. I am really just getting my feet wet in this series, but even with my limited knowledge, I can recognize a truly wonderful cookbook. The recipes are all quoted with lovely context. The food chosen just looks so appealing and delicious sounding. It also feels like just such a practical cookbook with the way it's laid out. We have the Unofficial Chronicles of Narnia cookbook. And I love the citations, I love the quotes. It is missing pictures and the organization feels a bit wonky, but the error appropriate recipes and the research that the author had to do to find these recipes really makes it a firm favorite for me. And at the number two spot, we have the unofficial Harry Potter cookbook. This one kind of similar to the Chronicles of Narnia where it doesn't have pictures, but it does have over 150 recipes each one is gorgeously cited with context. And we also get some historical context in the food, techniques, helpful tips and tricks. This is by far the most comprehensive and well-researched of the Harry Potter cookbooks that I have ever seen. Also, on a quick note, there is an updated edition from Target, which has a handful of photos plus a butterbeer recipe. However, the permanent front cover logo makes me prefer the original, over this new one. And last but not least, and by not least I mean the, the literal absolute best literary cookbook that I have ever seen is this Little House in the Prairie cookbook. I'm talking about the newer edition and while both of them are absolutely lovely with the insane amount of research that the author did to find the recipes and error appropriate and ingredient appropriate etc. The new one just has such a wonderful layout, it has so many gorgeous photos, and it's just, ah, oh, it is sheer perfection. I just love this book so much. It is truly one of the best literary cookbooks. You yeah, know, this is a little bit of a longer one, but like once you get me passionate on something, I am going to talk your ear off. So have a fabulous day. Happy reading. <laughs>